to My Bible Study Show on our YouTube channel where you can watch, study, share, and subscribe right here at My Bible Study Show 8308. Take a look at the corner there at the YouTube channel and you can get our link right there and share with your family and friends. Well, we did it as we promised. Woo, we finished the Bible reading from April. Now we're in a brand new month, the month of May. Are you excited that you made it this far? Is your resolution working for you? It sure is working for me. So we thank you all for our subscribers, for watching and sharing your uh, experience with us as you read your Bible. Well, let's get into and see what April is going to be bringing to us for the Bible reading plan. Well, in the month of April, as you can see, we're going to have we're going to have six books to read, okay? And out of those six books is going to be 129 chapters. We're going to have 5,206 verses, 103,480 words. Now, as I always say, every month this is an what? investment. So we get to make an investment. And for you that are new, that are beginning with us, I'm asking everyone, if, if this is your first time making a resolution to read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from January to December, I ask that you just read the Bible for one hour. Just read it. Don't go into study, try to research it in your first year. Let this just be the reading. Get comfortable. Get, you know, get in a uh, daily habit of reading the Bible. And so I call that an investment plan. If you could do one hour a day, this is what we can yield. Take a look at the time that we can invest. We'll be 31 days this uh, month, 31 hours, 1,860 minutes. That's just one hour a day that we can invest with God. But look what God gives us on a monthly basis. He's given us 31 days. 744 hours, 44,400, I mean, 640 minutes. That's what God is investing to us. And we're only giving him just a little tidbit, less than 10% of that back to God. Amen. So can you do that? I know you can. So as you can see, every month we give you a color-coded system. As you can see, uh, we have Chronicles starting us off from um, May 1st up until May 3rd. And we did Chronicles last month. So we're going to finish uh, those uh, few chapters right here in the month of May. And I just want to give a shout out to the May 3rd on that day. Uh, happy birthday to my youngest son, Aaron. He was born on May 3rd. Hallelujah. All right then, everyone. So as you can see, the next book we'll be reading will be Ezra. That's noted for us in green. That's going to take us from May 4th to May 6th. Then we're going to hit Nehemiah coming up on May 7th through May 10th. Then we go to the gold color, Esther, coming at us uh, April, I mean, I'm sorry, May the 11th through May 13th. And here's Job. Now, a lot of people be like, ooh, I don't want to be a like be like Job. Well, you can read uh, about Job starting uh, May 14th all the way to May 25th. And then we uh, move over to the book of Psalms and to the brown color there, that auburn color there. So that's going to be concluding with the book of Psalms. So with that being said, we got the books. We know what we're going to be reading. Let's take a look and let's get a little history on these books. So we're going to start with the book of Ezra. Okay, so let's take a look. All right, here we are, the book of Ezra. Now, the book of Ezra is the 15th book of the Bible, it has 10 chapters, 280 verses, 7,440, uh, 7,441 words. Time written was around about 536 BC. The writer, of course, is Ezra. So here we have the map. So when you're reading your book of Ezra, this is giving you a picture of what's going on because this was during the time of their captivity with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So they're coming out of that, coming out of that uh, captivity during that time. So Ezra was part of that. So as you can see here, the different areas, the different countries, and we got the timeline for you. So you can always uh, go back and watch this video again, you can pause it at the screen and really get uh, in-depth information right here at what we provide for you. So let's get a little history 
on the book of Ezra. Ezra, whose name means help, was a descendant of Aaron, the chief priest under Moses, and was related to Joshua, who became the high priest of the rebuilt temple. He was appointed to be a priest and a scribe. Ezra was also a prolific writer. In addition to the book that bears his name, he contributed to both First and Second Chronicles, as well as to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Ezra is a book of the Hebrew Bible, which formerly included the book of Nehemiah in a single book, commonly distinguished in scholarships as Ezra, Nehemiah. The two became separated with the first printed rabbinic Bibles of the early 16th century. Following late medieval Latin Christian tradition, composed in Hebrew and Aramaic, its subject is the return to Zion following the close of the Babylonian captivity. Together with the book of Nehemiah, it represents the final chapter in the historical narrative of the Hebrew Bible. So let's move on to the last final paragraph. The book of Ezra is divided into two parts. The first telling the story of the first return of exiles in the first year of Cyrus the Great, about 538 BC, and the completion and dedication of the new temple in Jerusalem in the sixth year of Darius, which was 515 BC. The second telling of the subsequent mission of Ezra to Jerusalem and his struggle to purify the Jews from marriage with non-Jews. So that's a mouthful right there, isn't it? Again, there's a lot of nuggets in here that make that will uh, help you to understand your reading as you're reading your Bible, give you some historical uh, information to guide you as you read the word of God. All right then, everyone. So let's take a look. And we're going to look at the book of Nehemiah. Okay, so let's see what Nehemiah has to offer to us in our Bible reading. So the book of, uh, book of Nehemiah is the 16th book of the Bible, and it has 13 chapters, 406 verses, 10,483 words. Time written around about 445 B.C., writer Nehemiah. As you can see, we have the same map inset because Ezra, Nehemiah, they was all right there together. Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Jeremiah, they all prophesied at the same time. So let's get some his, uh, historical facts about the book of Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah were contemporaries, and they both wrote about the rebuilding of Jerusalem, which occurred approximately 70 years after it was destroyed by the Babylonian under Nebuchadnezzar. Ezra wrote about the rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel, while Nehemiah wrote concerning the rebuilding of Jerusalem walls. From ancient times, the cities located in the Middle East were surrounded by stone walls with gates that were guarded for the protection of the citizens. The important men of each city would gather at the gate where they would conduct the business of the city, share important information, or just pass the time. Nehemiah stands as a testament to faithfulness and perseverance. He lived far away from his home. Yet, he never gave up hope that someday he would return to it. He spent most of, most of his life in exile in the pagan land. Yet, he never wavered in his faith and trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a prayer warrior, putting everything before the Lord in prayer, interceding on behalf of his people, and he was rewarded for his diligence and perseverance. Nehemiah cared so much for his people that he never gave up, gave up the hope of their restoration, not only to their homeland, but to the God that first called their forefather Abraham out of the same area and made a covenant with him 
one that Nehemiah believed would stand forever. Ooh, Nehemiah is very interesting, isn't he? So you want to read that book. You will find it fascinating. Let's take a look. And our next book, right after Nehemiah, comes the book of Esther. Now, Esther is the 17th book of the Bible. She has 10 chapters, 167 verses, 5,637 words. Time written around about 474 B.C. Writer, Mordecai. So again, Esther follows right along. She's coming after uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Jeremiah, and them, isn't she? So the same map, same area. So let's take a look and see what we can find out about the book of Esther. Esther's birth name was Hadassah. She was of the tribe of Benjamin and lived during the time Israel was exiled and eventually became queen who saved her entire people. Esther reminds us that nothing is impossible with God. After her parents died, she was adopted by her cousin, a man named Mordecai. This is quite fortunate for Hadassah because Mordecai was a God-fearing man who loved her dearly and raised her well in the face of dreadful circumstances. Trouble in the kingdom. Soon, Esther had the opportunity to stop trouble. Overhearing two of the king's officers angrily plotting to assassinate the king, Mordecai tells Esther, who then reports it to the king, crediting Mordecai. Last paragraph. God's deliverance through Esther. After three days, Esther courageously put on her royal robes and stood in the place she might die. But instead of death, the king granted her favor, asking her what she wanted. With her first request, she began a masterful plan that only God could have given her. But many of you probably heard about Esther. I encourage you to read the book for yourself. It is fascinating. What a story of redemption, of deliverance for salvation, whatever term you want to use. Esther played an important role of saving God's people. So read the book. You will be impressed. Let's take a look at the next book that we're going to read. Now, many of you are familiar with the story of Job. You know how that goes. So let's see what Job has for us. Now, Job is the 18th book of the Bible. And he has 42 chapters, 1,070 verses, 10,012 words. The time written was around about 1625 BC. The writer is unknown. Some say Moses, but that's, that's why I say some say. <laughs> so let's find out. Who was Job in the Bible? That's a good question, isn't it? Let's take a look. Other than being from Uz, and you see the map that we have here. This is where Uz is. It was originally called Luz, but Luz, Uz, it's the same place. It is right there, as you can see here on our map. So other than being from Uz, the first thing in the Bible tells us about Job is that he was righteous and godly, blameless and upright. A man who feared God and shunned evil. Take a look at Job 1, 2. Job was not only righteous, but also wealthy. We also know Job was a man greatly tested by God and even more greatly blessed by God. Let me stop right there. You know, uh, uh, take Job's name out. Many of us say, well, I don't want to be Job. I do. I be Job. <laughs> oh, it said God tested Job and then God blessed Job. So God is doing the testing and the blessing. I'll be Job. Amen. Let's take a look at our second paragraph. Job was righteous and a Gentile in the land of us, which is modern day Saudi Arabia. There lived a man whose name was Job. Job was not an Israelite. His non-Israelite status explains the absence of many key theological elements in the book, including the law, covenant, the temple, and reference re reference to Yahweh. According to the NIV Culture Background Study Bible, 
Well, we know how the NIV could be too, huh? <laughs> I'm doing another teaching on that, y'all. I'm doing a great teaching on your Bible. So you want to look uh, in the future for that teaching. So let's go to the next uh, portion of the uh, the screen here. How did Job suffer? Job then experiences ultimate human suffering at the hand of Satan, but allowed by God. The Sabians attacked and stole all of Job's oxen and donkeys and killed a portion of his servants. Fire fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and more of Job's servants. The Chaldeans attacked and stole Job's camels, killing even more of his servants. A mighty wind swept from swept in from the desert and destroyed the house where all of Job's children were gathered for a feast, killing all of them. Satan afflicted Job with painful sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Well, you know, I did say earlier, I want to be Job, but you know, when you get to that part when you start messing with your kids and stuff, not that part we don't want. We don't want that part when you start messing with kids. Then you can take my house and my cars and that stuff, but don't take my kids. Now we got a problem, God. We got an issue, Lord. Now I know you gave Satan permission, but do you have to give him permission to take my kids too? Read your Bible, y'all. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? All right, then, everyone. So that's a quick snapshot of the book of Job. You don't want to miss reading that book for this month of May. All right, let's head over to our next book of the Bible. Oh, here we are, Psalms. So we're going to conclude here in the month of May with a portion of the reading of Psalms. Remember what we said, this is going to be Psalms chapter one, and it's going to take us all the way to Psalms chapter 18. So let's take a look. Psalm is the 19th book of the Bible, 150 chapters, y'all. It's not a lot. It may seem like a big number, but you can do it. I know you can read them all. It has 2,461 verses. 43,743 words. Time written was around about 1000 BC. Writer, there's various writers and David is one of them. I mean, Moses wrote one and there's a lot of uh, David's uh, uh, people in his uh, entourage that wrote some of the Psalms as well. So who wrote the book? Let's take a look at the map. Here it is. You see the map here. Uh, we got Jerusalem right there. You know, that's where... Uh, David and Solomon them ruled from the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem. So you have your map right there. So Psalms is centered here. And let's take a look at some history. Okay. Who wrote the book? Psalms, a collection of lyrical poems, is one of only two Old Testament books to identify itself as a composite work containing multiple authors. Proverbs is the other. Some Psalms name their uh, name, their author, in the first line or title. For example, like I said earlier, Moses. Did you know Moses wrote Psalms 90? Mm -hmm. David was responsible for many of them, composing 73 Psalms. So David did almost 50% of the Psalms, didn't he? Asaph wrote 12. The descendants of Korah penned 10. Solomon wrote one or two. Ethan and Heman, the Ezraites, were responsible for two others. The remainder of the Psalms do not contain information about their authors. The book was originally titled Tehillim, which means praise Psalms in Hebrew. The English title of Psalms originated from the Septuagint Greek title, a Samoy, also meaning Psalms of praise. So now you understand how Psalms came about, how he got his name and what it means and who wrote it and why were they singing these songs of praises? Well, if you was in the wilderness and if you was uh, in battles with uh, Goliath giants and everything, you'd be singing songs of praises too when God deliver you. Amen. <laughs> we got some Goliaths today. Just, just, just name your debt. Uh, dead is a Goliath, okay? People can be a Goliath, okay? Oh, Lord, we need a song. We need a new song, amen. All right then, everyone. So, hey, listen, that's gonna do it for our Bible reading for the month of May. As you can see, here is the list. Here is the plan. 
get on the plan. You can do it. I would love to hear from you. Just send me an email to faithandlove2 at yahoo.com. If you don't want to send me an email, just make a comment right below here at the YouTube channel. And I would definitely uh, reply to your comment or your email as well. So again, watch, study, share, and subscribe. And we're going to see you next month for to continue this Bible reading plan. We'll be coming to you next month in the month of June. But in the meantime, remember, be a subscriber and go to the YouTube channel as we have it right over here at the YouTube uh, logo there at, use the at symbol, that's very important, at My Bible Study Show 8308. All right then, everyone. I'm Minister Love right here for your Bible reading plan for the month of May. Take care and God bless you all. Goodbye.